than you. And one said, I'm of Paul. And that makes me better than you. And another one said, I'm of Jesus Christ. And of course, that makes me better than you. But Paul reminds them of how he came to them. You can read how Paul came to the Corinthian church in Acts chapter number 18. Which is somewhat of a reflection of a previous attempt at evangelism in Acts chapter 17. Now as I wrote this last night and this morning, I thought it's somewhat presumptuous, Brother David, for me to thank for Paul. It is somewhat presumptuous of me to think that I know what was going on in Paul's mind. But in Acts chapter number 17, Paul had an endeavor into an arena of knowledge and wisdom. And it did not end well. At Athens, on Areopagus, or on Mars Hill, which was the intellectual capital of the world at this time. It's, it's where everybody that was a great thinker or a great speaker would go and they would banter about uh, their, uh, their thoughts and their ideas. And, and Paul, who comes preaching the message of salvation and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, uh, is invited to, to speak with them on Mars Hill. Paul said some very eloquent and very powerful things at Mars Hill. He said, for in Him we move and live and have our being. And, and it said uh, that He had made of one blood all nations to have, for, inhabit the earth. And He knoweth the bounds and the framework of our habitation. And there were so many good things that Paul said. But he also, if you'll find in uh, uh, verse number 28, I believe it is, you don't have to put it up there, but Paul even, even used quotes from their own philosophers and their own poets uh, in, in his discussion with them. And at the end of Paul's talking, and we know that Paul, I'm not going to get into it all together, but Paul was academically and intellectually qualified to speak with these people. But when he got up there and he told them about Jesus Christ, when he got to the part about the resurrection of the dead, that was the end of it. He started talking about the resurrection. And the Bible said, some of them said, we want to hear a little more of this later. A portion of them ridiculed and made fun of him, mocked him. And even though there were some who believed, it appears to be Paul's biggest recorded failure when he entered with the power of the Holy Ghost and the message of the gospel into a carnal arena to discuss with them, even using their own writings against them. And though he was qualified to do that, with theologies and philosophies, etc., he was very quickly reminded that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. He was, he was reminded when he stepped into an arena where he brings the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and the Word of God into an arena. That, that, and he, and he, he began, and, and I, I wrote this down, but I, then I erased it, but I'm going to say it anyway. In a manner of speaking, he belittled himself in order to fit in the arena of what they expected. I said he, he brought himself down from what the Lord had done in his life so he could fit the criteria of what the people expected and it was a failure because our weapons are not carnal you're not going to argue anybody into this you're not going to browbeat them into this I even knew a fellow one time that he would witness to people it's kind of funny because he wasn't a bad guy but he would witness to people and if they disagreed with him they'd end up in a fight he had to resign his position on more than one occasion as the outreach director. He would come to the pastor and say, I got to quit. Why? I was out door knocking and punched a guy in the mouth. That, that's somewhat comical, but it, it in one way expresses the the entire ideology of what I'm trying to share today. I want you to notice this in verse number 3. Let's skip to verse number 3. Paul said, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. Why? 
If you read the Bible, Acts 17, he's on Areopagus, he's on Mars Hill, he's among the elite. And they make fun of him and run him out of town, in a manner of speaking. Nobody told him he had to leave, but he had tucked his tail between his legs and took off walking. And he shows up at Corinth. And he says, I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. He is not coming to Corinth off of a resounding victory. He's coming to Corinth off of a defeat of sorts. He's coming to Corinth fresh off of, I just knew, I just knew that I was going to show up on top of that hill. I'm starting to feel the Holy Ghost right now, so, so beware. If you're going to go to sleep, you better do it right now. Because it's not going to be safe in a few minutes. He said, I just knew if I got the opportunity that I was going to get up there and I was going to tell them what the Word of the Lord says. And I was going to preach the power of the Holy Ghost to them. And they were going to forget everything they had ever heard. And everybody was going to drop all their stuff. And they were going to come gather around me. They were going to come gather around me and believe the Lord based upon my intelligence based upon my philosophical thinking. Because you see, Paul moved himself into a carnal arena. Are you following me this morning? But then it didn't work out like he wanted. He preached, he gets... We have to understand, I don't really, I don't really know how to, how, how to give us a contemporary uh, picture that would... Uh, it, it, would it would be like... Uh, uh, maybe, maybe President Obama is standing there giving a speech, you know, with the president's seal on the box. Y'all have all seen that before? And it would be like him saying, hold on a minute. Pastor Keene, come up here and tell these people what you believe. So all the TVs and all the cameras and everything would be upon me. And I've got the opportunity to tell them about Jesus Christ and the death, burial, and resurrection. And they're all going to listen. And there's going to be people falling on their face throughout the entire world turning to Jesus Christ. So, it is my great and distinct privilege and honor today to stand before you humbly, no good, saved by the grace of God, and tell you about Jesus Christ. Before I take any questions, let me give you a little bit of my background. I was raised at the feet of Gamaliel. I was a member quite possibly of the Sanhedrin court. I was a Roman citizen born not bought. My qualifications speak for themselves. Now if you give me about 30 seconds, I'll tell you about Jesus Christ. And then I'll talk about Paul some more. Now I took a little bit of liberty with that. That's not exactly how it was. But I need you to see where Paul was. I need you to see where Paul was and, and how it would be today. But then because nothing happened. Nothing happened. As a matter of fact, his farewell is mockery and ridicule. So he shows up at Corinth. He says in weakness. Everybody say weakness. weakness. Fear. Say it. Fear. And much trembling. Now we have to understand, those of you that have read the Bible to any degree, that's not Paul. That's not Paul. Paul stands before Agrippa. And Paul stands before Festus. And Paul even says, you fellas ain't good enough. I want to go to Caesar. But that's not where he's at right now, coming from Athens to Corinth. He shows up at Corinth, a whoop puppy, in weakness and fear and much trembling. Because you see, when the Lord spoke into Paul's life, Acts chapter 26, verse 16, 17, and 18, He said, But rise 
and stand upon thy feet, for I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of these things which thou hast seen, and of those things in the which I will appear unto thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles unto whom I now send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. That's what Paul, I mean the Lord is telling Paul, this is what you're going to do. Well then brother David, he shows up at Athens and it don't happen like that. Not many converts and there is no record of a church being established in Athens. The Lord said all these great things are going to happen through your ministry and you're going to preach to these Gentiles and they're going to turn around and they're going to follow me. Didn't happen at Athens. Let's back up to 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse number 2. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now wait just a minute. On Athens, on Mars Hill, He even quotes, He says, as some of your own poets also say. Verse number 28. You can read it for yourself. He tried to use a frame of reference, Brother David, that they could relate to. He tried to talk to them from, if, for lack of a better word, from a carnal perspective. But then he shows up in Corinth and he's reminding them, this is how I came not to you with excellency of speech, words of wisdom. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Now there's another little lesson I'd like to share with us through this passage. But the reason for this determination that he's made, he said, I made up my mind, I don't want to know nothing among you. Except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I don't care what your poets have said. I don't care what your religious leaders have said. I don't care what's going on in your life. I've determined. I've made up my mind. It ain't nothing but the cross message coming out of this mouth. And Jesus Christ. Because it's determination is a result. God have mercy on me. It is a result of a lesson that's been learned. Paul was taught a lesson on Mars Hill. It did not come from the philosophers and theologians, but it came from God. And what I might tell you this morning is those of you that despise your failure, those of you that are angry over your failure, what you need to stop and ask yourself is what is God trying to teach me through my mistakes? We equate failure, automatic failure, as a sign that we're carnal, as a sign that God has abandoned us. God has left us. And I'm telling you that some of the greatest lessons you ever learn in life are when you pick yourself up out of the quagmire of your biggest failure. Paul learned a lesson. The lesson he learned is it ain't their poets that's going to save them. It ain't their philosophy and their theology that's going to save them. It ain't there to see, hear, or tell some new thing which they were very, very adamant about doing. It's not an altar to the unknown God that's going to save them. He said, I've determined, I've made up my mind, I don't want to know nothing among you except Jesus and Him crucified. Because anyone who receives salvation, anyone and everyone who receives salvation will first visit the cross. I don't think you heard me this morning. Anybody who wants to be saved is first going to have to visit the Calvary's cross. The message of the cross is salvation. And they are not coming. God have mercy. They're not coming any other way. 
to the way of the cross involves sacrifice. The way of the cross involves self-denial. Paul said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, you might write this down. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 through 4, tells us the gospel. The gospel is the way of the cross, and it's the only way. The death, burial, and resurrection. Repentance, water baptism by immersion in Jesus' name, and the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Nothing more or nothing less. And Paul received a revelation that says they aren't denying me, they're denying you. And I've got to understand that all my responsibility is is to love people and preach the truth. If they don't receive it, it's not me they're not receiving, but it's Him. And my speech, verse 4, and my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. While at Corinth, Paul was somewhat disillusioned, certainly building on his state of mind from Athens. And you'll find in Acts 18 and 6, the Jews again, coming off of what happened in, in, in Corinth, in Athens, the Jews at Corinth refused to receive Paul too. And the message he preached, and he made a dramatic proclamation. Acts 18 and 6. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth or from now on, I will go unto the Gentiles. Paul then goes to reside and preach in the house of justice whose house adjoined the synagogue. Now while he was there, he preached, preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Crispus, if you're looking for a name for your child, don't use that one. I just got through reading. This has absolutely nothing to do with the lesson today, but I need to take a break. I just got through reading the begets in First Chronicles. Man, I feel sorry for them, some of them poor children. <laughs> you, come along, you come across a name that's got like seven letters in it, and you feel kind of relieved. Because <laughs> the ones you just got through reading had like 15 letters. Go, go, homo, homo, so, pipa, popodio, or something like that. Justice, he's in the house of justice. That was funny to me. I remember Brother Chitwood came in and did a comedy routine at a Christmas banquet we had one time. And he had somebody, maybe in Brother Zip, get up and read from First Chronicles. And he'd read those, stumble over those things, and then Brother Chip would say, Stop, stop right there! And then just expound on it about how great it was, and you know how he was feeling the spirit and everything between, you know, Bill beget Sue, who beget Fred, who beget such and such. Mama sent me a text message the other day while she was reading it, and she said, What is this all about? Hey, man, I, I really don't know the answer to that, but they had some crazy names in the Bible. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, and all his house believed, and many who heard the word believed and were baptized. That's 18 and 6. Now I want you to go take me, Brother Mark, to verse number 9. Well, back, yeah, you stay right there. So the Jews, he goes to the Jews, or he's at Athens, and he fails. No church is established and very few converts. He shows up at Corinth. He shows up at Corinth, weak, fearful, and trembling. He's doubting himself. Can I get an amen? amen. Somebody who's doubted yourself before? 
When do you usually doubt yourself? After you fail. Weak, fear, weakness, and much trembling. That's how he showed up at Corinth. And then he goes and preaches to the Jews, and they refuse to hear him. You can read it about 18, 3, 4, 5, something like that. They refuse to hear him. So he takes his garment and shakes it, which is a proverbial shake of the dust off your feet. Meaning if they ain't interested, I ain't preaching. So if y'all ever see me shaking my coat up here, I'm I'm not going to do it, just teasing. So he shakes it off and tells the Jews, I ain't messing with you no more. Your blood be upon your head, I'm going to the Gentiles. So Paul's not really stepping too high. But then he goes to Justice's house and he starts preaching in this house that, that adjoins the synagogue. And while he's preaching, Crispus and all his house, and Crispus is the ruler of the synagogue, him and all of his house believe and are baptized. And many who heard the word, many who heard the word believed and were baptized. So you would think maybe Paul's feeling some feeling a little bit of security and feeling a little bit of sense of success. You know, he ain't been doing too good in the last few days. And now he's got a few converts. But then the Bible tells us in verse number 9 that a vision appeared unto Paul in the night time. And said, now, I, how many has ever read this passage before? How many of you remember reading this, this right here? Acts 18, 9, and 10. I remember reading it. I think about it in my mind sometimes. But I, I learned last night, today, I've been thinking about it all wrong. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. I never had a vision. I've had some really strong dreams. I've known people that have had visions. That's another one of those things. I'm, I mean, I kind of like to, but I ain't sure if I want to or not. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, then spake the Lord to Paul in a vision, in the nighttime by a vision. And look what he says. Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. Now, the Lord is not in the business of idle words. And, and I preached a message a couple of years ago, maybe about three now, and I'm probably, I've been thinking about preaching it again. But the Lord... I mean, you can have a smile on your face or your lip dragging the ground and it don't affect the Lord. He, the Lord don't minister to the you that you show everybody else. The Lord ministers to the heart. I said, the Lord doesn't minister to the you that you show everybody. The Lord ministers to who you really are. And Paul comes out of Athens weak, fearful, and trembling, doubting himself, doubting his calling, doubting everything. You know what? There ain't nothing that'll mess you up more than people that won't listen to what you say. Until we heard this message today. Somebody said amen by faith. Come on now, you know what I'm talking about. Man, you can shout all over the place, have a Holy Ghost throw down. Be, you know, you're still feeling goosebumps when you go home and chuck your clothes to get in the bathtub. You stand underneath the shower and you forget to even wash yourself. It's like, whoo! Anybody ever been there before? I said, has anybody ever been there before? Y'all need to answer a brother when he hollers at you. But then, you step out of the shower, there stands a mad kid. Then you walk in there, all bubbly and stuff, and there stands your husband frying him some eggs, about to beat the skillet to death. I got an imagination. Ain't none of this ever happened, but it's happening right now in my mind. 
You're so full of the Holy Ghost and so full of everything. And uh, what are you doing? What's it look like I'm doing? I'm making me some eggs because you just stood in the shower and used all the hot water going, Woo! 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 <laughs> I'm about to starve to death. What does it look like I'm doing? And then all of a sudden you done forgot. All the spirit's done gone. And you can go from one minute walking on water to the next minute feeling the flames of hell licking at your feet. Huh? Now that's a little bit of hyperbole. But you can walk in somewhere and walk out. I thought everything was good. I thought I had it made. I thought that... I feel the Holy Ghost right now. I thought I had arrived. But then you find yourself in weakness and fear and trembling. Well, I feel the Holy Ghost really, really strong right now. But I, I thought I had it made. I, I thought this was it. I thought I had arrived. And then I went in there and he took everything I had. His old scrangy, raunchy eggs. I hope he burns them all. Hope he's up all night with indigestion. I hope they was out of date when I bought them in their runt. Y'all feeling me? It's amazing how how oh God have mercy. Brother David, I think it's fair to say this is where Paul is. He comes out of Arabia and he comes, does all these great things. His second missionary journey is at Corinth. So it's all happened on the first missionary journey and the other things. And he's, he's all, you know, my goodness, man, he is the most special person in the world. We never know of anybody else getting struck down by a son that was really the Lord. You don't ever see that happening by anybody else. That's how Paul became introduced to Jesus Christ. Is a light shined down and made him blind for three days. So now he's preaching and he's having some success. But then the Lord comes to him in the nighttime. Everybody say, Everybody say, In the nighttime. What is it about the nighttime? Huh? When you're all alone with your own thoughts. When you can be laying there in the bed like this and a million things going through your mind. This tells me, Brother David, that Paul ain't got the victory. He He's preaching the message and he's, man, I feel the Holy Ghost. My goodness gracious. I wish y'all could feel what I'm feeling right now. My Lord and mercy. And he's laying there and the Lord comes and says, the first thing, be not afraid. What was Paul afraid of? What was Paul afraid of? Now I want you, I want you to receive this word. You've got to receive this word and we've got to read it the way the Lord intended for it to be. Be not afraid, but speak. And hold not thy peace. Read, read the Bible. Read the Bible. Marcus, read that for me. The whole passage. Then spake the Lord to fall in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak and hold not thy peace. What's going on inside of Paul? <laughs> Doubt and fear. And where is it hurting him at? I know it's in his mind. Do I need to have somebody else read the the Scripture? It's affecting what he says when he's preaching. The Lord is not going to say, if you're hungry, 
The Lord is not going to speak to you and say, let me give you a drink of water. <laughs> the Lord, when He speaks to you, He speaks what you need to hear. <laughs> Mercy. Paul, I got a word for.